Okay. So, everybody, why don't you uh, lead us off and I'll continue. Sure. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's staying warm and toasty on this uh, cold day. I was just outside with my kids a little while ago, and it's uh, it's certainly uh, it's certainly a little chilly out here, and the snow is beautiful. But what better way to warm ourselves up with uh, than with a little bit of Torah? And we really have a, a, a huge treat for us today that we have the opportunity to hear from uh, Rebison Smadar Rosenzweig. So thank you so much for making time to be with us today. Uh, world famous, literally, for her erudition and Torah and kindness. And it's always special when we get to make that uh, unique Memphis uh, Rosenzweig connection. And so I want to thank uh, Rabbi Finkelstein uh, for helping organize all this. And it's great to see all of you here. And I'll hand it right over to Rabbi Finkelstein. Thank you so much, Rabbi Learfield. We appreciate it. And it's always great to do stuff together. Um, we, we do want to thank our sponsors today. That's Dr. Phil and Barbara uh, uh, Lieberman, who uh, generously sponsored once again. Uh, they, they sponsored the Rosenzweigs the last time. And it's always in memory of uh, Phil's parents, uh, of, of uh, Dora and Herman Lieberman, we, who are beloved members of our congregation. We remember them today, these Echonambra Baruch. Their memory should be should be blessed. Uh, Professor Rosenzweig, as everybody Lairfield mentioned, is a much sought after speaker. Uh, one sign of her great popularity is that the great weekend where thousands of people gather at uh, the APAC convention these days, uh, right before the APAC conference in the good old days, uh, where tens of thousands of people gather. The Shabbos before, these are a few thousand people. And they usually ask Mrs. Rosenzweig to, Professor Rosenzweig, to share a few words at that occasion. But most prominently, uh, Professor Rosenzweig has been a professor of Bible at Stern College for a number of years after having studied uh, at Columbia, both undergrad and, uh, and several master's degrees from, uh, from, from Columbia. And uh, she has become an incredible teacher of Tanakh uh, with great, great energy and great inspiration and has inspired a whole generation of young women who really become outstanding scholars. So uh, with that thought, uh, privilege to, to introduce and to welcome today uh, Professor Smadar Rosenzweig, who can share with us a few words about getting ready for Purim, putting, putting Esther into the historical context. Thank you so much. Hi, it's really such a pleasure to be here today. I want to say that, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and to see Rabbi Binyam Lairfield from the Baron Hirsch Synagogue. Thanks for being the co-sponsors in a bigger sense today. And it was a pleasure for us to be in Memphis. I also want to acknowledge and thank the Anche, the Anche Sfard community for really organizing this amazing event and to really spearheading this. I want to thank for sure uh, Rabbi Joel and Bluma Finkelstein, our Mechutanim, who really played the lion's share in organizing this. It's always such a pleasure to do things with them and to share family and to really share simchas. You know, we got our simcha right before <laughs> COVID and we were able to come to Memphis before. So it was really so wonderful to really see everybody. And we even spent uh, time with um, Dr. Why Dr. Lieberman. So that was no, really no. very special. I really want to, I'm looking. So I'm looking forward to starting this shayor. So without further ado, our question today is, how do we put the Gilates there in context? And the context we're going to be discussing is going to be the context of the Tanakh. So we're going to read Esther back into history, back into Tanakh, and see where it fits and what messages do we get and do we learn from Gilad Esther. I'm going to share screen. So those who want to see some of the sources, I will share the sources and it will make the whole experience smoother for those who want to see the sources to see where the sources are that I'm speaking about. And for those who don't want to, it is just as enjoyable. Our topic really discusses a big issue. Megillah Esther, the book of Esther, is one of the last books in Tanakh. And the question is, so what is its message? And what we're going to see is that Megillah Esther looks frontwards and backwards. It goes back into history. And there are a few important ideas that I would like to dis dis discuss today. One important idea is the idea of redemption, personal 
and national redemption. Mickey Lattestare is a story about individuals, but also a story about a nation. It's a story about Mordechai and Esther trying to redeem their family history and to redeem the Jewish people. So Megillat Esther has to be read on both levels. Another element of Megillat Esther is that the last books in Tanakh deal with two very different ideas. One is the return of the Jews to Israel. Nehemiah and Ezra, the Jews, B'nai Israel, return to Israel, and they're trying to build the new future. And there are successes and failures, dangers and times of joy. So too with Megillat Esther. What does it mean to live in exile? Is it smooth sailing? Is it totally just success? Or does it have a difficulties as well? And that is the joint question and the joint message that we have in the end of Tanakh. What's going to happen to the Jewish people now? Some are in Israel and some are in exile. What's going to be their future? And does your past impact your future? And what we're going to see in our Shi'ur today, that Megillah Esther very strongly wants to say your past influences your futures. And you can never forget your past if you want to move ahead. You always have to deal with things in your personal history, in your family history, and in your national history. When we start Megillah Esther, we start it with the whole palace story of Ahasuerus, but for us, one of the most important parts is when we start with Mordechai. And we say this out loud together because this really starts the very important Jewish part of the story of Megillah Esther. And if we look at Mordechai's background, right away, we have two elements. We call Mordechai Ish Yehudi, that he is Jewish, but Yehudi also could mean that he's from the tribe of Yehuda that he's from the tribe of Judah. On the other hand, we see by the end of the Pasuk, he's Ben Shimi, Ben Kish, Ishimini, but he is from the Benjamin. He is from the Benjamin tribe. He's from Binyamin. So who is he? Is he from Yehuda or is he from Binyamin? And the Midrash gives many different answers. Maybe his mother was from the Judah community from the tribe, but his father was Binyamin, and that's how he's identified. But also, Mordechai is a result of two different things in history. On the one hand, the Malchut, the kingship of Judah, but also there's going to be a legacy of the kingship of Saul, of Shaul HaMelech. But if you look at the first pasuk we speak about Mordechai, we only talk about Ben Kish Ishimini. We talk about his lineage, but we don't talk about King Saul of Shaul HaMelech. And our big question is why? And we open up about Mordechai already with this idea that there's something in Mordechai's background, in his Benjamin background and his Benjamin background, which is going to be a kind of a blemish. And what is it? Even though he comes from Saul the king, Saul the king, right? Shaul HaMelech did not destroy Amalek like he should. And he did not destroy King Agar, Agag. So the Gemara says very strongly in source number two, we see that, oh, even though Saul was a king and he was the first king, he fails by not killing Agag. And as a result, Haman was born. Because we're going to see that Haman's name is Haman Ha'agagi. Haman from the family of Agag. So there's going to be a direct line of Shaul's actions, Saul, the king's actions, and Mordechai's great, 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 great ancestor, and what goes on in history. So when we see in the Megillah, when it talks about Mordechai, the question is, okay, this is after the destruction of the temple. And what is going on with the Jewish people? They were exiled. And we see that the word exiled is mentioned four times. So the question is, is Mordechai going to look at exile as a place of death? We're being exiled and the temple is destroyed and now it's time to die because you can't live anywhere else outside of Israel? Or is it a time to rebuild? And what Mordechai does, despite the emphasis of exile, 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 we find that he rebuilds family. He brings in Hadassah, Esther. 
and he really is a father to her. He cares about her. And this is the way that he sees that we are building a future even in Galut. This is not saying, oh, we're in exile. This is the end of the Jewish people. There is a future to the Jewish people, even in exile. And the Gemara says something very interesting. Who is this Esther? Who is this Hadassah? And the Gemara in Megillah, we're in source number four, explains Esther, she's really average. She's not tall. She's not short. She's average because her name is like a myrtle. And a myrtle is kind of an average. When we talk about the lulav, the lulav is tall. The etrog is small and beautiful. And the hadas smells beautiful, but it's, you know, not one of the most striking of the items. The Midrash even says maybe she's even of a green complexion. So how is she so desirable later on? Because the Gemara wants to say, chesed there was something special about her. She had grace, which means the Gemara wants to describe Esther because we don't know much about her. It just says that she's special and she's unique and she has great qualities and she finds favor in other people's eyes. There's some special quality about her. And what's beautiful about Esther is that she is an average individual who we'll see in the whole beginning of the story is quite quiet. And Mordechai says her to be reticent and stay back. Don't tell your identity right away. And what that helps us to understand is that here is a heroine who starts out really pretty quiet and passive, but is able to develop. She's able to become one of the great leaders in Jewish history. And that's very important for us because sometimes we have an Abigail type. We have a Miriam type right away when they write about them, boom, they are making an impression. They are standing up for ideas and rights. But then we have Chana and we have an Esther who really have to develop and grow into their role, but have an immense impact on the Jewish people. So that's also a very important message about Esther. There's something hidden about her and that's her name, Esther, but she is something special. And there's another idea that the Gemara wants to develop. The Gemara continuing this idea wants to explain that Esther had this unbelievable modest quality. And this modest quality is not something that is only seen in Esther, but in her whole line, in her whole lineage, which we start from Rachel, and then we go to Shaul HaMelech, and then we go to Esther, we see this line of being modest. Rachel doesn't go in when Leah was given to Yaakov. She gives her the sign and is quiet. Shaul hides when he's given the kingship. And Esther, we see hides in the beginning. She's quiet, she's reticent. We also know that we have this same connection with Binyamin. Binyamin also is quiet in the whole selling of Yosef. So this idea of being quiet, of being reticent, is a very important element of Rachel and of Esther and of all these individuals. Another important element for us to understand, to set the stage, because we're going to use these themes from the Gemara to understand Megillah Esther. Another element is Shaul received kingship. And even though he loses it, when Hashem gives greatness to a person, it stays forever. So there's somewhere in the future generations that this greatness can be latched onto, can be redeemed, can be brought back. And we're going to see this parallel. Shaul was the first king, but Esther is also going to be called Esther Hamalka, Esther the queen. So this idea of monarchy continues in this line. So we have a few important themes that we want to discuss. Number one, the idea of tzniyut, of modesty. Number two, this idea that greatness was really given to this line, and it's always there in a latent state. And anyone from the family can go and attach to it. In addition, Shaul does not finish his job of destroying Amalek, so it's left for future generations. And who are going to finish the job? it's going to be Mordechai and Esther. So in this way, we're going to look back into Tanakh in order to read Megillat Esther. And in the whole beginning of Megillat Esther, we only see Esther in a very passive way. She is taken to the house of the king. She finds favor 
in everyone's eyes, but she never states where she comes from because Mordechai told her not to state it. And in everything that we see, we see that Mordechai takes the more outward proactive role and he tells Esther to be in the palace, to be quiet, never to reveal her identity. So we also have two modes of activity here. We have the Rachel Shaul mode, which is being quiet, being reticent. But on the other hand, we have Mordechai, because Mordechai, when he sees Haman, he is not going to bow down to him. He openly goes against Haman. So we have two different approaches here. Esther representing the Shaul Rachel line, and in a sense, Mordechai not doesn't really represent the Binyamin line so much, but he seems to represent the Yehuda line. In Yehuda, he steps forward to speak to Yosef. David, when he wants to fight against Goliath, he steps forward. So the designation of Mordechai HaYehudi, the Judahite in a sense, really fits in addition to just calling, oh, the majority of the Jews were now from the tribe of Judah. So we're using the designation of Mordechai HaYehudi. It's deeper than that. Mordechai represents stepping up, stepping forward, using the actions of kings, and Esther is more reticent, continuing in the way of Shaul HaMelech. What happens? We all know. As a result of Mordechai not bowing down, so Haman is very upset. And Haman decides we're going to destroy all the Jews. And the language that's used is Lahashmid Laharog to destroy all the Jews from young and old women and children in one day. And what are they going to do? They're also going to take the spoils. Ushlalam Lavoz. All their spoils are going to be taken, which means this is a war. We want to destroy them because the Jews are different. As one of the earliest ideas of anti-Semitism. They're different than us. They don't do whatever the king wants. And Haman is upset. They don't do what he wants. And he wants to destroy all the Jews. And the emphasis is on the entire population and to take the spoils. And they send out this letter to the entire empire. And a very important word in Pastor Yudalid, lihiyot atidim layom When the letters were sent out, it was that you should be ready and look to the future for this day. What's the idea? The idea is that not only was this destruction set, but it was also celebrated in a way. Everyone mark this on your calendar that this is going to be the day we are going to destroy all the Jews and you'll be able to take the spoils. And yet Haman and the king, even though they just sent out this decree to kill an entire nation and destroy an entire nation, they're sitting for their party they're sitting and they are drinking. They sit to drink. So why do we have this animosity? Is it just coming from nowhere, from out of thin air? And now we're going to investigate where are the roots and where we see the roots here are very deep. This is an altercation. This is a conflict that already goes back generations. Who are Amalek and Amalek? is Haman. Haman is from Agag, who was the king of Amalek. They come from Esav. Esav is the grandfather of Amalek. And this is a very interesting idea because this conflict goes all the way back to Yaakov and Esav. We know that Esav and Yaakov have conflicts. And Yaakov took the bracha from Esav. So this hatred and this conflict already starts very early. Yaakov had the lineage and the continuity of all the blessings. And Esav was very successful with his material blessing, but we know the conflicts go further. In Shmot, when the Jews come out of I Egypt, when the Israelites come out of Egypt, the Amalekim come and try to defeat B'nai Israel. They weren't in conflict with them. They just come in order to defeat the Jews. And the Jews fight. B'nai Israel fight. The Israelites fight. And Yehoshua, also from Rachel's family, he is from 
Ephraim. Ephraim is from Yosef. Yosef is from Rachel. He fights with Amalek and he weakens them, but is not able to destroy them completely. Moshe is davening with his hands up in the air and Yosho is fighting physically, but they're not able to defeat them. And Hashem says to Moshe, you have to write this as a memory in a book because I am going to erase the memory of Amalek under the world, under the sky, under the heavens. So this is a very old conflict. And we know that we are told to remember what Amalek did when we are established in Israel and to destroy Amalek. And when B'nai Israel came to Israel and had a king, Shmuel tells Shaul, you have to do this job. Now we know this is so difficult for us. We are such a compassionate people and we care about others. And the laws of war are that we always have to ask the other groups for peace. So destroying Amalek is a very difficult concept for us to understand. And Shaul is told by Shmuel, this is a command from God and you have to do it. And the language that is used is that also to destroy from man to woman, young and even a suckling and the animals, but you're not allowed to take from the spoils. This was very difficult for Shaul to understand, but Shaul does not ask Shmuel what's the right thing to do. Instead, he goes and he fights this battle and he does murder the women and children and he takes from the spoils and he leaves the king Agag alive. If Shaul really had moral and ethical questions, he should have gone to Shmuel, who was the Navi at the time. And maybe he would have understood better. And he would have understood that this is something that you have to do in a way that you show that you are towing the high ground. Don't take the spoils. If you take the spoils, it looks like you did it for the money. But Shaul takes the spoils and thinks he can use the spoils in order to worship God. He also leaves the king alive, Agag, who represents this whole nation. Could it be possible maybe that he should have only killed the king and left the people alive? If he would have asked Shmuel for clarification or something else, we don't know. This was the command, but he doesn't fulfill the command and he leaves them and he doesn't fulfill. And as a result, he loses the kingship. And Shmuel cries out to Hashem about the failure of Shaul. When Mordechai finds out about this decree, he also cries out. And we see this idea of crying out in three places in the Tanakh. Again, we're always connecting it to earlier places. Number one, we just saw there's a long history of this comparison. Number two, we saw also this comparison in the language. The Jews could not take spoils from Amalek, but Shaul did. Shaul leaves the king Agag alive. And what do we call Haman? Haman Ha'agagi. He is a direct continuity of Agag, which means showing the failure of Shaul to do the word of Hashem. So Shmuel cries, and also Mordechai cries when he hears this unbelievable decree. He feels responsible. He's the one who didn't bow down to Haman. And now these are the consequences. But when Mordechai is crying out, he is crying out in a way that he feels a terrible um, disappointment. And also it is like sitting Shiva. What is going on? He cries and he tears his clothing and he wears sackcloth because he is in Avelut. He is in mourning and he cries out. What's happening to Mordechai is that he sees the consequences of his actions. He put all of Bnei Israel in trouble and he is now in Avelut. He is in mourning. He came to Bavel. There was a destruction of the temple. He felt we can relive, we can grow our families in exile. And yet what did he see from his actions of being a proud Jew and going against what Haman decreed? 
that he put everyone in danger. And he feels now this is the end. And that's why he's in mourning. And that's why he's wearing sackcloth. And what does he do? He comes to the gate, but he can't go past the gate because he is wearing sackcloth. Before he's always at the gate of the king, but now he can't pass through. And every place that he, his actions are found and heard, everybody's in mourning and everyone's crying out to God and everyone's wearing sackcloth, which means all the Jews realize this is the end in exile. 127 lands received this decree to destroy the Jews. And as we said, Atidim layomaze, everyone marked it with a big X on their calendar, waiting for this great moment. And everybody is now feeling the end is near. This also has a historical background. Who else cries a bitter cry when he realizes that he loses part of his future and blessing? Also, Asaph cries. And the Medr says something fascinating. Because Yaakov took the bracha from Asaph and made Asaph cry, so too now B'nai Israel have to cry. In Tanakh and in Jewish history, we have this idea of ma'aseh avot siman labanim. Whatever happens to the grandparents and two generations past will always affect future generations. The Ramban, Nachmanides, speaks about this in a very clear way. Everything you do will have an impact, measure for measure. In a sense, I call it spiritual thermodynamics, which means everything you do will have an impact. Yaakov, by taking the blessing the way he did and making Esav cry, now Esav's grandchildren, Haman, who's Agag, who's Amalek, who's Esav's grandchild, right? This is their lineage. Now it comes to a head. Is Esav going to be able to defeat B'nai Israel now? They're already weakened. They're in Galut. They're already all dispersed. They thought they were safe in the 127 lands of Achashverosh, who originally was pretty liberal. What's going to happen here? Mordechai sees the parallel, and he says, maybe we are going to be paid back now, and there's no future. I tried my best. I stepped forward. But there's another way to solve this, and that is in the indirect way. And that is the Esther way. And that is the Shaul way. I mean, he didn't do it well, but she's going to fix it for him. And that is the Rachel way. And now Mordechai realizes that he has to approach Esther and ask her now to step up. He tried his Yehuda way, and now she's going to do the Binyamin way. And what is his advice? He says, throw yourself down at Achashverosh's feet and ask for the mercy of B'nai Israel. That's what you have to do. Go there, throw yourself down at his feet, beg. And Esther says, I can't do that. We all know. I haven't been there for 30 days. He hasn't called me and I cannot step forward. You step forward, but that's not the way I behave here. I have to wait to be called. There's a whole different protocol. So Mordechai tells her, Al tedami b'nafshech. Don't think that you can save your life by hiding in the palace. Mordechai thinks that she's holding out. He has her in the palace for this moment to step up when his modus operandi isn't working. And Mordechai is telling Esther, don't think only about yourself that you could hide in the palace. And this is a very interesting idea because early back in the history, the daughter of Shaul, who was married to David, is looking out the window of her palace and looking at David dancing with all the people. And she says, we don't do this kind of thing. We're a kingly family. We don't act in that way. And Mordechai is thinking that she's looking at herself in that way. Oh, I'm in the palace. I'm safe. I'm separate from everyone. I am going to save my own neck. And Mordechai is telling her, you can't use that separation that the Shaul family, that Michal, the daughter of Shaul, used. You have to step up. So even though our MO from the Shaul family and Binyamin is quiet, they even say that the stone for Binyamin in the Choshen, in the breastplate, was Yashpeh, which is Yashpeh. He has a mouth, but he's quiet. Right now, your chance and your job is to step up. 
So Mordechai tells her, Im tacharishi, if you're quiet now, then B'nai Israel are going to be saved by another venue because Hashem's always going to save the Jewish people. But you want to be that messenger. So if you're quiet now, and look, it's double language, hacharesh tacharishi, Hashem is going to save the Jewish people because Hashem always saves the Jewish people. But this is your chance to redeem your family name. You who represent Shaul, with the tzniyot and the message of Rachel for so many generations, more than Mordechai, who's more identified as Yehuda, you have a chance to redeem the family name, to redeem Shaul. Remember, we looked at the first line discussing Mordechai, and we don't even go back and mention Shaul because it's a little bit embarrassing. Shaul did not defeat Amalek, and that's why we're in this trouble. So what we see here so beautifully is that Mordechai is telling Esther, you have to step up. You have a chance to redeem your family name. If you don't step up now, and who knows if you received kingship for this moment. It's not for naught that you're queen and Shaul used to be king, but we lost the line of kingship. Now is your chance. And this is the reason you became queen. So what does Esther say so insightfully she says get everyone together and fast for me and don't eat for three days and also i'll fast different than mordechai mordechai is already in avelos he's mourning he's thinking the end is near this is the end finished esther doesn't say put sackcloth and continue that no bring everyone together knosset kolite bring all the jews together and they'll fast and this fast is going to be thinking about the future of making a difference in the history of am israel we can save everyone if we stick together and now look at the difference now mordechai does everything that Esther commanded him. So a total switch in the Megillah of who now is controlling the story? Who is the proactive one to make things happen? Originally it was Mordechai, told Esther to be quiet. Now he's begging her to step up, but she says, okay, I have my own plan. Your job, get everyone together and fast. And now I will set up what's important to be done. And what does Esther do? The first thing Esther does is she sets a trap. And what is the trap? The party. That same party that they used in order to laugh when they were gonna destroy all the Jews, as we said, Haman and Ahasuerus, ha ha ha, were drinking after they signed this decree. She's gonna use a party, a wine party, in order to destroy Haman. What's her first action? She invites just Haman and Ahasuerus to the party. She already wants Ahasuerus to be a little suspicious. And that night, after that first party, what can't Haman, what can't the Hashverosh do? He can't sleep. Why can't he sleep? Hashem doesn't let him sleep. But also his conscience doesn't let him sleep. Why does Esther want to invite just Haman and myself? Mm, he gave a lot of power to Haman. Is Haman going beyond his level of power? Also, he can't sleep. They bring the Sefer Zichronot, the book with all the stories of what happened to him and who saved him. And what story, of course, comes up? Yad Hashem. We have the story of Mordechai. And what did Mordechai do? There was a plot to kill the king. And Mordechai, through Esther, told the king and saved his life. But nothing was done for Mordechai. So Ahashverosh is upset. And he says, okay, go in the yard and find somebody to give me an idea of what to do in order to pay back Mordechai. And again, so beautiful. Shem Hashem, Hashem's name is not mentioned in the Megillah because it's our job to find Hashem in everything in our life. We see something, we say, oh, it's natural. Oh, it's just so happenstance. It's from the actions that I do. But if you see all the details, we just start a teeny weeny process, but we are totally in the hands of Hashem. And we see this here. Achashverosh can't sleep. He said, oh, me b'chatzer, find someone in the chatzer, in the courtyard, and I'll ask advice. What should I do for Mordechai? And who happens to be in the courtyard? Haman. That already is raising more suspicion. How come Haman is in the courtyard in the middle of the night? Haman wants to hang Mordechai, so he wants 
an okay for the big scaffolding that he has. But for a Rosh, he's thinking, oh, it's just the two of us in the party. Haman's here in the middle of the night. And then Haman digs his own grave. Because what does Haman say? What am I thinking for the person who the king wants to honor the most? Give him the crown, give him the horse, give him the clothing of the king and say, oh, this is who the king wants to honor. What is Ahasuerus thinking? What is Haman thinking? Does he want to replace me? We know dressing in that way means that you are really taking over. Clothes are the man. And in such a turnaround of event of Anahafahu, which we use as a theme of all of Megillah Esther, Haman, we know, has to do this for Mordechai. And the Gemara says very smartly, what does the Gemara say? What did Esther do? Pachim Tamnalo. The Gemara, and as we said, we're following the ideas of the Gemara to explain these ideas in the Megillah. Esther is planting, right? Destruction all over. She's putting obstacles and she's tripping Haman up in everything that's going on. So by the second party, when she is telling Achashverosh, that Haman is the one who wants to destroy me. You have to understand, she never said where she was from. So all of a sudden to come out and say, oh, Haman is my enemy. Why should Achashverosh choose Esther over Haman? But she has been planting these seeds that Achashverosh is suspicious of Haman. And when Achashverosh hears that Haman wants to destroy Esther's family and nation, and he walks out of the room, Achashverosh comes back in to see Haman throwing himself at Esther. So again, Achashverosh is very upset. So this is plan number one. What was Esther able to do? Esther was able to sow these seeds of discontent between Achashverosh and Haman. And Achashverosh said, hang Haman on the scaffolding that Haman thought he was going to hang Mordechai. Why? Before Esther wanted to plead her case for her whole nation, like Mordechai said, just go and plead for all of B'nai Israel. Esther realized that she had to redeem her family. She had to make sure that Haman is going to be destroyed to make up for Shaul leaving Haman, his grandfather, alive, Agag. She had to make sure that that history of her family had to be redeemed, had to be changed had to be taken care of. And then what does she do? Then she throws herself at Ahasuerus's feet and she begs that the decree should be removed. Now we all know the decree could not be removed, but the Jews were given the ability to defend themselves. And look at the words. Even though the Jews were given the ability to destroy men, women, and children and take their spoils, the Jews very, morally and ethically did get together to defend themselves and they did not take from the spoils. And it keeps on saying they did fight their enemies, but they never took from the spoils. And when they were attacked, they defended themselves in all 127 lands. So the language, they did not take the spoils. Here too is a tikkun, a redemption for what happens with Shaul. One of the biggest mistakes, he takes from the spoils and he makes it into a war for money as opposed to a war on principle, which is a very difficult war, but it's God's command. Here, B'nai Israel do not take from the spoils when they're defending themselves, even though the decree allowed them to because they wanna show that this is about defending their lives. They're not doing it for the money. It's a war on principle. They were gonna be annihilated and now they are standing on principle and defending themselves. And this day that would have been the destruction of B'nai Israel turned to a day of partying and remembrance. But the actual day of the war is actually the day that we fast and only after the battle, the next day, Yudalid, is really the day that we have the Sauda that we celebrate. Because even then we know that we could have been destroyed. Who knows what would have happened if Hashem didn't stand on our side. 
So the first day of the war is really the fast. And then afterwards, it's a su'uda hoda'a, thanking Hashem for saving us. And we do this every single year. And what's beautiful about Esther is that she looked to the past to save her family name and also Am Yisrael. In addition, she looks to the future. We have to learn from the story of Megillat Esther, of Bnei Israel banding together, of Bnei Israel having emuna, of Bnei Israel realizing that even in Galut, things are difficult and we don't always see Hashem openly, but we have to look for him everywhere. And that's why this became a real holiday because it teaches us that message of hashkacha, teaches us that message of having this emunah. It teaches us that message that no matter where we are and things are terrible, Hashem is with us. And Esther pleads with the Chachamim, and she says, Kitvuni ladarot, write me for generations. And the Anshe Knesset Agdola agree with Esther. And what are the words that are used in the Gemara? The Gemara explains, when she asks, set me for generations, Rabbi Eliezer says, yeah, because the story of Megillat Esther is in Shmot, as we saw. It's in Devarim, as we saw, which we're going to read this week. And it's also in Nevi'im, the story of Shaul. And then we have the story of Megillat Esther, which is a continuation of that chain of history. We are not an island. We're part of Jewish history. We're part of our families. We're part of the continuity. Whatever we do, we have to look back into the past and realize in the present what we should do. And that will help us also set standards for the future. Megillat Esther and Purim really teaches us that very important message. And especially in our day now, with everything going on, this idea of making sure that we look to our past, no matter what is happening, we have a very strong misora. We have very strong traditions to help us get over many different many difficulties and many things that we feel oh, are insurmountable, but they are. And we take that strength and we help, you know, in making, that helps us make decisions and then we can really change the future. And it doesn't matter who we are because everybody, whoever they are, can use whatever talents they have, whether it's the outgoing talents, Mordechai and Esther work together on this, but really here Esther steps up, but does it in her special way. They work together as a team, each one, using their strengths. But really, Esther is the final heroine of the story. That's why we call it Megillat Esther, because it was her actions that really turned the tide of Bnei Israel with Mordechai, but she's really the main one. And that's why Megillat Esther is called Megillat Esther. And yet we realize and know the importance of Mordechai who works with her hand in hand in the beginning, the middle and the end. And that's why we mention Mordechai out loud three times in the Megillah. It was this beautiful joint effort with Esther really taking the lion's share as the Megillah goes forward. So I just really wanna wish everyone a Simchat Purim and a very special time that we should be able to celebrate and v'nafochu. Here we are in coronavirus, so many crazy things are going on, but we know that this is going to be overturned, that good things are going to happen and that we can take a part in that. And we know that this Yeshua of Am Yisrael, of the world, is going to happen bekarov because Purim is all about v'nafochu. We really started coronavirus around Purim last year, and hopefully the inklings of the beginning of the redemption from corona, the nafahu, turning it around, is going to really start in earnest over Purim. And always good to have something to celebrate in this difficult time. So Rosh Chodesh Adar, and here we are looking forward to Purim. Smadar, thank you so much. My husband had to step away for a moment, so I just want to thank you for that beautiful presentation. And I'd like to open the floor up for questions. You can unmute yourself if you have a question, or you can put it in the chat. And while everyone's thinking about their questions, I'll just take the liberty of asking the first one. 
So when when Esther says that she before Esther says what her plan is and when she tells Mordechai why she can't go, I've always wondered whether maybe that was not her not willing to step up, but it was more fitting in with what you said that it was, I can't do it the way you want to do it. I'm going to do it my way. And, but maybe she really felt that way even before Mordechai said, you know, you, you're here for this moment in time. And that maybe really that transition of when she was willing to stand up came maybe a little bit earlier. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? That's an excellent comment and question in the sense that from the beginning, we really see two different modus operandi between Esther and Mordechai. And the question is, is she looking at Mordechai and saying, oh, you know, that kind of frontal attack is not going to work? Or is she really quiet in the palace and whatever Mordechai tells her, she does? So in the Megillah itself, we have no inkling. This is the first time we have her saying anything in the Megillah where we come to this Paragdalid. So it's fascinating that so many Prakim pass. So we don't know, is she thinking of a plan? And when Mordechai confronts her, she already thought about this? Or does it really just come when he is approaching her that she really thinks about it? And we can really take both approaches. I think that the way the Megillah is written, it's more that she's in the palace thinking, I always relied on Mordechai to take care of things. He told me of the poisoning, I told it to the king. He is telling me to do X, Y, and Z, but at the moment that he's not bowing down and she finds out about the decree, it could be that at that moment she realizes that's not the tactic. I live in the palace. I know how things work. Vashti was kicked out and killed because she went against what Ahasuerus felt. So at that point, there might be a realization that when she finds out, she realizes, okay, that's not the way things work in the palace here in Shushan. We have to take a different tack. So I like your approach because at that moment, she realizes when he tells her, throw yourself at Ahasuerus's feet, she realizes, you know, we have to have a certain process here to get things going. And she also knows the characters, how their ego plays such an important role, whether Ahasuerosh, we saw that with Vashti, or with Haman, that he gets so upset that when Mordechai doesn't bow down, he's willing to kill his entire people. So she understands the ego is much better. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions, please? Feel free to unmute and ask or put it in the chat. Comments? Come on, you all know Miggy Lotta Stairs so well. Everyone yeah. has opinions. Can I ask a question? It's Lenny. Hi, thank you so much for, for, uh, for your talk. This is fascinating. And when you talked about the, uh, the Yehudi, that uh, Mordechai was a Yehudi, but Benyaminite as, as well. But then it says later the Yehudim, you know, that all of the Jews are Yehudim. So I wondered if you could comment on the how that happened, that we all became Yehudim, you know, from B'nai Israel. I mean, are, is it now the first time that's mentioned or is it something that's evolved? Okay, excellent question. The Jewish kingdoms were divided into two kingdoms. After Shlomo, his son only received two tribes, Yehuda and Binyamin. So the whole southern kingdom of Israel was Yehuda and Binyamin, and the whole north were the other 10 tribes. The 10 tribes were exiled in 723 BCE. There was a destruction by the Assyrians, and when the Jewish temple was destroyed in 586 BCE, then we only had mostly two tribes left, Yehuda and Binyamin. And the exiles were mostly from Yehuda and Binyamin. As time went on, the Binyamin tribe was so small that they pretty much were swallowed up by the Yehuda tribe. So when you want to talk about the Jews, you call them Jews because they were from Judah tribe mostly. 
because the 10 tribes mostly assimilated when they were exiled. But this is the first time that we're mostly in the last books of the Bible is when we speak about the Jews as Jews, Judah. And that's how we got our name. So on the one hand, you could just say, well, we're calling Mordechai HaYehudi because he's Jewish, right? He's part of the bigger community, which he is. And he's a leader of the Jews. But it's also interesting that his personal identity is really Binyamin. And when we say his lineage, these are all people from his Benjamin family. So it's interesting that he has this double identity and we consistently call him Mordechai HaYehudi, leader of the Jews and the Jew. So that's just an interesting play because there's so much history that he represents as a Benjamin, but he also has this, we always speak of him as Mordechai HaYehudi. So it's also maybe this clash between these two identities, which was a little what I wanted to discuss today. Thank you. Uh, my husband has a question. <laughs> yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, Professor Buma, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Um, this question is something that uh, Buma and I have discussed. The question is, um, when you say that she's redeeming her family uh, history and undoing the actions of, of uh, Melech Saul who killed King Saul, um, is that a conscious or an unconscious process? That is an excellent question which means what we're seeing is how the Megillah is written. And the Megillah is written in a way that it does so many of these plays on words that it is written very consciously to show the connections of all these things in history. Because the destruction of the people of Shushan, the destruction of uh, Amalek. Looking in the palace, Michal in the palace. Um, Shaul about being quiet by Hikemacharish, and here with her Imacharish Macharishi. Atu Beitavich, the Megillah is written with so many references. So many references. We call this intertextuality. So many intertextual references that it very strongly makes this connection. We, this Shabbos, are going to make that connection very strongly. Because we read in the Haftorah, we read the story of Shaul and Amalek. We read Parsha Zachor, which we read in Devarim. On Purim, we're going to read Shmot, the story of Amalek attacking. And we read the Megillah, which means Chazal already very early on were making these connections. So the way the Megillah is written is that all these connections are very strong. And the implication is that this is a redemption of what she's doing. Even though it doesn't say, and Esther thought, oh, I'm putting all these pieces together. But the way the language is written, it's connecting all these pieces. And also the idea of the crying out, where you have exactly the same language with Shmuel, with Esav, with Mordechai. So this idea, and that it's an old story, and it's an old rivalry. We keep on calling Haman Ha'agagi. Just call him Haman. Ben Hamdata, right? Why are we going back to Mordechai HaYehudi, right? So the Amalek, Bnei Israel, Esav, Yaakov. So the Megillah is written very strongly in that way. So too, I'm just going to give another example. When we talk about Rut, the way Megillat Rut is written, it's always responding to what went on early with Yehuda and the Yehuda and Tamar story. And the connections between the two. So Tanakh is written for us in a way that highlights definitely all these connections, implying that the individuals were thinking these connections. But clearly, who's ever writing this, this Sifrei Tanakh are telling us very clearly. And the Masorah is that Esther and Mordechai wrote Megillat Esther. So that would be a very strong um, plus in that column. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? 
We have time for one more. Someone wants to, anyone? I see a lot of special people on the list. I remember you from last year. I know everyone here has so many good things to say and wonderful comments. So this is our opportunity. We can't come in person, but this is our way to celebrate together. I want to welcome Amanda, who's here with us as well, uh, from out of town. Good to have you with us. It's really so special for um, me to be here. And thank you, thank you Rabbi. So I want to want to thank Professor Rosenzweig for taking the time, and thank you for challenging us and for getting us to think about the Megillah in really new and Esther in new and interesting ways. And of course, thank you to the Liebermans for, for sponsoring. And thank you to Baron Hirsch for co-sponsoring. And hope everyone has a wonderful, a wonderful Purim. Chag Purim Sameach to everybody. Yeah, Chag Purim Sameach. And I hope that when everyone's reading the Megillah, we'll really look at all the language and read it with more, you know, insights, not differently, but with different insights and with a way of understanding all these connections. And there's so many more. We only had a short time to speak about some, but there are so many. And um, it's just so wonderful to read the Sifrei Tanakh and to get insight and inspiration for us today. So Purim Sameach. <laughs>